There's no 
Hey, it's good to be here with everybody, Fick and family, congratulations. Uh, it was just awesome uh, having Meredith baptized this morning. Uh, I want to welcome everybody here to St. Mark's, all those of you online at St. Mark's Online. If you're a guest with us, we're really glad that you're here with us in the beginning of our Advent season. Uh, we are starting a new series entitled uh, Just Mercy. And today we're talking about mercy triumphing over judgment. Advent is always the season where we, you know, light the Advent wreath uh, candles, things like this. And so you'll see those those candles being added to each week. Um, But we're in the season of Advent, so glad that you're here with us as we prepare our hearts and our minds for Christmas. To do that, I want to dive into a couple different scriptures, and they're not... Christmas scriptures. They're they're not Advent scriptures. We'll get to those next week, but I I had to start with this as we talked about mercy. Um, And so the the first scripture is Matthew 7, verses 1 through 2, uh, something that uh, I think uh, many of us are familiar with, and I'll just read it real quick here. It says this, do not judge, or you too will be judged, for in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Um, You've maybe heard that before. It's probably one of the most misunderstood and misquoted scriptures uh, of all time. That's what Jesus says in Matthew 7, but the other text I want to bring to you this morning is from James 2, and that's what we're going to focus on a little bit this morning. These texts go hand in hand. And so James 2, verses 8 through 13 says this, if you really keep the royal law found in scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing right. But if you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. For he who said, you shall not commit adultery, also said, you shall not murder. If you do not commit adultery, but do commit murder, you have become a lawbreaker. Speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Mercy triumphs over judgment. This is the word of the Lord. God's grace, mercy, and peace be to you from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. That's how I used to start every sermon I ever gave when I first came out of seminary. If you were to look back in the annals of my first church, I don't know if this is even out there, but you can go back and listen to some of my sermons. Almost all of them I started with, God's grace, mercy, and peace be to you from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The reason I started like that is because that's how my dad started all of his sermons. And as a, as a son who's got a, a, a pastor for dad, and you're starting out in a ministry, you know, you, you think to yourself, this is the best part of my sermon, this first line. God's grace, mercy, and peace be to you from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. And uh, it also happens to be the way that Paul greets people in some of his letters, and especially his letter to Timothy, his letters to Timothy. And so for years, I started with that that line. And then it dawned on me, what does it mean? You know, we hear it, but what does it really mean? And so I probably gave up on it. And instead, I started with, good morning. (laughs) Very sacred, very religious. And I introduced myself and things like that. What, What does God's grace and mercy and peace be to you even mean? Let's just leave off peace for just a second. Let's talk about grace and mercy. What's the difference between the two? What's the difference between grace and mercy? Uh, It's been said that grace is when we receive what we don't deserve, and mercy is uh, when we, how's it going? Let Let me back it up. Grace is when we don't get what we deserve, and mercy is when we get what we don't deserve. Does that make sense? I didn't make it up. I'm just quoting somebody. I got something much better than that. Just kidding. What's the difference between grace and mercy? Actually, since this was the weekend of mercy, if you spent time with any family members at all 
this weekend. There should have been some mercy in your life. Will you turn to the person next to you and tell them what kind of mercy you showed them this weekend? Okay, go ahead. I know you did. Just turn to the person next to you and say, I showed you mercy this way. I do hear some audible gasps, like, oh, wow, you really did that for me? You know, it's so funny, uh, this this really is a season of mercy, and Advent comes right on the heels of Thanksgiving. And have you ever noticed that the President of the United States shows mercy on Thanksgiving weekend? How many of you notice every year the President of the United States pardons a turkey? I've never seen the President do that, but you know, (laughs) The president really could do that. The president pardons a turkey. How ridiculous is that? What what are you if you're really a crazy person, you do wild things and maybe mischievous, you're a turkey. Hasn't anybody ever called you a turkey? You turkey. Turn to the person next to you and say, you turkey. If you're a chicken, you're scared of something, right? But if you're a turkey, you're mischievous. And so the President of the United States pardoned, he showed mercy on a mischievous animal, a turkey. Now, how many of you pardoned your turkey this weekend? Not a single one of you, I know it. Merciless, that's what you are. God's grace, mercy, and peace be to you from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, amen. Let me tell you what I think mercy is as we start this series on mercy this season. I think mercy is the artwork of grace. Now let me explain what I mean. Grace can be summarized as God's righteousness at Christ's expense. Okay, that's G-R-A-C-E, did you catch that? God's righteousness at Christ's expense. It really means that what we said before, all of our sins were paid for by Jesus so that we don't have to pay for our sins. That's grace. But mercy to me is the artwork of that grace, meaning mercy to me is that compassion, it's that feeling, it's that emotion exercised in life for somebody else. And so I I put on the screen here one of my favorite pictures of all time. I will talk about this picture in a sermon probably once every year, every two years, just because it means so much. It's the picture, it's Rembrandt's picture of the prodigal son. And how many of you have ever seen this picture? Anybody? It's just fascinating, Rembrandt. It's been picked apart, this picture, but it's the story of the prodigal son. The prodigal son is the one that's returning to his father, and when you get a real close-up look at the picture, you get to see the father's hands are just, the Rembrandt, the way he does hands is so wonderful. Right? You, could, you could feel the mercy in the father's hands. The father's not holding his son down. The father's not, not wanting to, to make the son feel terrible. He's, he's got his hands on him like, mercy, I'm here for you. I'm your dad. And the father's face, obviously, is looking down on his son, not in disgust, but in love and mercy. And you see the son, he's got one shoe is completely torn off, his clothing are, is tattered. And there's one interesting character, and we don't know who all the characters are, but I, I like to think of the character that's in the top center, in the back in the shadows, as the prodigal son's older brother. You could barely see him up there, but he's looking on, and he's wondering, what, what's going on here? Maybe it's the older brother's, the guy with the, 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 the black hat. We don't know particularly. Some people debate this. Maybe he's upset. Any way you look at it, you're seeing mercy in the father to the son. Mercy is the artwork of grace. And when you see acts of mercy, you see art in human form. When a son comes back to a father who is lived a terrible lifestyle, and the father receives his son. That's an act of mercy. (laughs) When you're at work, and the company says, we're gonna lay off 500 people, 
and then they decide not to. And they said, you know, we're just gonna, we're gonna lose off the top line a little bit here. It actually is an act of mercy. We're not seeing that right now in our country. When somebody welcomes you into their home for Thanksgiving dinner, that's an act of mercy. Mercy is all around us, and it's the artwork of grace. And too often we don't practice mercy in our lives because we're stubborn. We're stubborn people. We're like the prodigal son who thinks he's got it all figured out. He's wasting away all that he has on licentious living. He's squandering all his money, and he forgets about mercy until he receives it overwhelmingly from his father. Let me tell you some reasons why we forget about mercy. Number one, we don't practice mercy because we forget that we once were the prodigal son. We have all been shown mercy at some point in our lives. Think back, if you're an adult, to when you were a kid. Think of a time when you were shown mercy. I was in fifth grade. My name is Paul Hennings. I had a friend whose name was Steve Henning, without an S. We were buddies, and we were cheating on all of our math assignments. <laughs> and we were good at it. I was so good at cheating that I thought that if I only gave myself like a 95 to a 98 instead of a 100, the teacher would never suspect. Folks, I was not smart as a kid. And so, of course, the teacher found out when she realized that those two turkeys were scoring 98s on their math quizzes. That's impossible. And so she found out, she confronted us, she told our parents, and then she had mercy. Because then she said, I'm going to sit down with the two of you and teach you math. Because I know you don't get it right now. It's mercy. How many of you have been shown mercy in your life? How many of you have been shown mercy by your spouse? How many of you have been shown mercy by your boss? We forget that we've been shown mercy. That's why we don't practice it. We also don't practice mercy because we get frustrated. The opposite of mercy is the word again. That's the opposite of mercy. Has anybody ever said that to you? or you've thought that to yourself, again? I can't believe you did it again. We get frustrated with people. We don't like it when people continue to hurt us or inflict pain upon us. And so eventually we say, well, forget mercy anymore. It's war. We get frustrated with one another. How many of you were frustrated ever at all, just in the tiniest bit, this weekend? I mean, I know you all have perfect in-laws that come over. I know that you all have perfect relationships with all of your family. We get frustrated, don't we? Because we forget that we've been shown mercy. And so we get frustrated at other people. And the final reason we don't practice mercy is because we enjoy finger pointing, not finger painting. That would be more along the lines of Rembrandt, but finger pointing. You ever, I, I know you've heard this. When, when, just point your finger at me real quick. Point, I just want to feel all of this. Okay? Now point it at the person next to you. Okay? And you know that every time you point your finger, how many are pointing back at you? For most of you, three. Right? Yeah, I'm sure you've heard that before. We enjoy finger pointing because it makes us feel better about ourselves. But if you really realize what you're doing, you're pointing fingers back at yourself. See, we like to feel better about ourselves. And so many times, we, the way we feel better about ourselves is that we we, we think about others in a judgmental light. And so Jesus says, do not judge or you too will be judged. I wonder if Jesus in this moment was telling his disciples, God gave you five fingers. Stop pointing one at them, 
one of them at others because three are pointing back at you. Now, we have no idea if Jesus said that, right? But I can imagine that Jesus would use some kind of metaphor like that to say, hey, do you understand mercy? This is not mercy. I find it funny if, if you're in the business world and you've, taught, you've been taught ways to approach people. Now you're taught to point all your fingers at them. It seems to me that you don't understand what's going on. <laughs> we enjoy finger pointing. But Jesus says, don't judge or you'll be judged from the same way that you judge others. That's how you're going to be judged with the measure that you dole out. That's the measure that you are going to be measured by. That's because Jesus understands mercy. He gets mercy. Too often we forget mercy. We get frustrated and we finger point. But we have been shown so much mercy. In fact, it is the season of mercy. Advent is the season of mercy because we are reminded that Jesus comes to us as God in heaven puts on our skin, puts on our clothing, all because of mercy. We've been shown mercy in the cradle in Bethlehem. Every time you see a cradle this Christmas season, every time you see a manger, I want you to think about God's mercy. That God would send his one and only son, not as a prince of the world, not as this amazing king, but as a lowly little baby in a manger. It's mercy. And then I want you to think about the cross in Jerusalem because that's mercy as well. Whenever I see uh, Christmas scenes of a, a wooden manger or wooden cradle, I always think about the wood of the cross because Jesus is born in the wood of a cradle, in the wood of a manger, so that he might die on the wood of a cross. Jesus is born in Bethlehem, and there were shepherds at night watching over their sheep when he was born. Those sheep were most likely the same sheep that were going to be used for sacrifice in Jerusalem. And so John the Baptist, he cries out, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Because he understands that just like Jesus was born in Bethlehem and the sheep that were raised there are used for the temple sacrifice, Jesus would be sacrificed for us on the cross. It's the mercy of God for us. And finally, the mercy of God is going to be seen when Jesus comes again. Peter talks about God not being slow but wanting all people to be saved, that's because God is merciful. And so we're going to take this topic of mercy, and we're going to talk about it all the Sundays leading up to Christmas. We, the, the Bible is full of mercy. The word is used over and over and over again, and I have to admit to you that when I was preparing for these messages, I didn't find a lot of resources on mercy, and I think that's because we don't understand it, and we don't like showing it all that much. We like talking about grace because that's when we don't get what we deserve. But I think we don't like talking about mercy too much because that's when we give to others what they don't deserve. We like to receive, right? But I'm not sure how much we like to give. And Christmas is the season of giving, of showing mercy. Let me take you back to the Old Testament real quick here. There's a passage from Isaiah that talks about the mercy of God. It says this, Let the wicked forsake their ways and the unrighteous their thoughts. Let them turn to the Lord and he will have mercy on them. And to our God, for he will freely pardon. Just like the president pardons a turkey. So turkeys can come to God. And God will freely pardon because of God's mercy. Now, what's interesting about this text is that it's right before another verse that I know that most of you have probably heard before. And if you haven't, it's okay. You're going to hear it today. Because we quote this next verse right after this, this verse all the time. It goes like this. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. 
Maybe you've heard that before. Maybe it's been preached about in a sermon. And some pastor has gotten up front and said, you see, you don't think like the Lord. You don't know the things of the Lord. So how can you fully understand the Lord? And I would tell you, "Er, that is not what it means, okay? It's not about how grand God's thoughts are and how amazing God's ways are. It's actually about mercy. Because we don't understand the mercy of God. Our ways are not merciful like God's ways. Even our thoughts are not merciful. Just go back for a second and your thoughts over this weekend. Now, I had my in-laws over. I had my sister-in-law over. We had kids over. And there are family dynamics. Anybody have family dynamics? Mm -mm Mm-mm-mm. Let me tell you, If I had swagger, which I'm not really sure I do, I could get my swag on, all right? Because let me tell you, there are moments this weekend that I had thoughts that were not merciful. (laughs) I'm sure nobody had those thoughts about me. God's thoughts and God's ways... It's not about how much greater God is or how much more God knows. It's about God's mercy because that's what the verse right before this talks about. That's what the verse says. Let the wicked come to God and God will show them mercy. He will freely pardon. Freely. There's no strings attached. It's like, it's like uh, I almost called it Good Friday. I meant Black Friday. <laughs> it's like Black Friday deals. It's like these emails. How many of you got a bunch of emails this weekend about all the deals that were going on? Oh, yeah. Yeah. There's always strings attached. Have you ever noticed that? Right? God's mercy doesn't have those strings attached. God just gives freely, and God says, come to me all who are burdened, I'll give you rest. Come to me if you're a turkey. Come to me if you're a chicken. Come to me if you're a platypus. I don't know what that means. Come to me, everybody, because I have mercy for you. I know you're not going to get it. This is what God says, because my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. My ways are higher than your ways. You will never fully understand my mercy but I'm gonna show it to you nonetheless. God has given this mercy to you and me through his son, Jesus Christ. It is beyond our wildest imagination. It's beyond our most generous kindness. This is what it means that God's thoughts are not my thoughts, neither are my ways God's ways. And so it's God's mercy that allows us to start over. It's God's mercy that allows us to start right. It's God's mercy that allows us to live well. It's, it's, it's not our own concept of mercy. It's God's mercy in our lives. King David understood this, and he, he wrote Psalm 51, which is something we usually read at, at Lent time, but I, I love how it fits into Christmas. David is an Old Testament guy. Uh, he was the king of Israel, and, uh, you know, he, he was on top of his palace one day, and he sees a beautiful woman. People took baths on the roofs of their houses back then, so it's not a good idea. I would not suggest it. Um, and so he sees this woman, Bathsheba. She's beautiful, and he determines that he, he, he wants to be with her. But she's married. That's a problem, right? Remember what James said about adultery and murder? He says, if you commit adultery, that's bad. If you commit murder, it's bad. But you can't say, I didn't commit murder. Even if you've committed adultery, you're still a sinner. Well, David does both of them, okay? He says, I want Bathsheba. And so Bathsheba's husband, Uriah, he's in the military. David sends him off. He tricks him, da-da-da. He gets killed. And so not only does David commit adultery, but he also murders as well. Now, this is the guy that's supposed to know the Lord and love the Lord with all his heart, soul, and mind. And he does this. 
And then he pens these words because he understands that he had, he had sinned against God and against Bathsheba and against Uriah and against his country and against his friends and his family and against their future son and against everyone that he knows. And he cries out, have mercy on me, O God. You notice what he doesn't say? He doesn't, he doesn't rattle off some prayer of penitence or, or, or something else. He just simply says, have mercy on me. According to your unfailing love. That word unfailing love is the, the Hebrew word which describes God's compassion and care and kindness and everything that is good about God that God showers on God's people. And so it encompasses all of the feelings and emotions of what it means to have mercy on somebody. Do you know that God has feelings and emotions? I know that's strange for us as Lutherans sometimes, you know, to have feelings and emotions. But God has feelings and emotions. I think God is talked about in Scripture, you know, being injured when God's people sin against God. God has talked about being like a mother who receives, a mother hen who receives her chicks under her wings and the compassion that God has. God has emotions. It says that all of heaven rejoices when one sinner repents and comes back to the Father. God's got emotions. God's excited. God is happy. And all of that is bound up in this word, unfailing love. And it's this mercy and this compassion. It's for you. It's like, a, it's like the father and the prodigal son. It's God's mercy that overflows in your life, and it empowers you to start over wherever you're at, to start right, and to live well. And so I don't, I don't know where you're at in your life right now. I don't know how your weekend went. To be frank, my weekend went pretty good. For the first time ever, I don't think we burned the thing. I don't think we messed anything up. It was, I mean, our, our, our Thanksgiving dinner was mwah, muy bien. I mean, it was delish, right? How about yours? Was it okay? It was good. It was real good. I don't know where you're at right now. I don't know what things happened over this weekend. I don't know... Um, how your relationship with your family is, your relationship with God, your relationship with others. But if you're in need of some mercy, you're in the right place. Because God gives it to you this morning and every day. Every breath you take is mercy from God. And if you're sitting there and you're thinking, Paul, I don't really need mercy this morning. I'm a pretty good turkey. I haven't messed up that bad. Life is pretty good. It's other people that need mercy more than me. Then I'm here to tell you that God is especially extending mercy to you. <laughs> because here's the deal. You need to be able to experience mercy before you show it. I truly believe that. If you don't think you've ever experienced mercy, it is very, very difficult to show it, which gets us to this text from James. Mercy extended to others is triumph over judgment. James says this, speak and act as those who are gonna be judged by the law that gives freedom. What is the law that gives freedom? The law that gives freedom is love your neighbor as yourself. You see, it gives freedom because if, it gives freedom because if you live your life that way where you love your neighbor as yourself, there, there's just joy. There's, there's peace. I'm not saying that life is perfect, but for you, you can stand before God and before your neighbor and say, I have acted justly with you. I have acted righteously with you. And so James says that if, if you're to live like that, that's great. Because that, 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 uh, type of law that love your neighbor yourself, it actually gives freedom. But it also includes mercy. Because how can you 
love your neighbor as yourself without showing them mercy. Because if you love yourself, you've had mercy on yourself, haven't you? See, that's, that's the trick here that James is trying to get us to understand. If you're gonna show mercy to other people, if you're gonna love them like the, like the golden rule says, like the law that gives freedom, you have to start from a place of mercy. And in my opinion, that mercy comes from God. It comes into your life when you realize how great God's mercy is for you. And then it extends to others. And that is how mercy triumphs over judgment. You know, we live in a world full of judgment. We like to judge one another, don't we? We like to look at the speck in our brothers and sisters' eyes way before we look at the log in our own. We like to think that God's gonna, God's gonna give you what you deserve, right? We like to think that, don't we? They're gonna get what they deserve. My son yesterday, I was foolishly letting him surf YouTube. And so he came up to me, and it's amazing how God just throws these things in your life, because I knew I was talking about mercy today. And he comes up to me, he goes, Dad, I just watched something. What does the word karma mean? That's what my eight-year-old asks. And so as a, as a diligent dad, I spent about 30 minutes talking about Eastern religion, Buddhism and Hinduism, things like that. And then I got done with that, and my son said, thanks, Dad, and walked away. Yeah, that's what happens sometimes. I think a lot of us think that, uh, you know, Jesus saying don't judge lest you be judged is, is like a statement of karma, right? And I want you to know, I'm, I'm sorry to tell you this, but karma is bogus. And let me, let me tell you something even more from the words of Bono himself. You don't want karma to be real. Because if the things that you dole out actually would come back to you, you'd be in pretty rough shape, right? That's karma. You see, this, these passages are not about karma. They're not about showing mercy so that you would receive mercy or, or being nice so that nice things would happen to you. It's not about saying, hey, don't judge other people because you don't want to be judged. It's not, it's not karma. It, what it, this is all about is taking the mercy that you've received from God through Jesus Christ and extending it to others freely. It's somehow getting into the thoughts and ways of God that are higher than our thoughts, that are higher than our ways, and humbling ourselves and starting from a place of mercy. You know, you know be, getting on our knees and saying, yep, this is, this is, again, my posture, right? Because it's the posture of the prodigal son. Because this is how I've been shown mercy. And from this position, to show mercy to others. This is how mercy triumphs over judgment. It's how we win the world over as Christians, by the way, as well. It's how you win your neighbor over. It's how you win your coworker over. It's how you win your in-laws over. It's how you win your friends over. It's how you get your friends back. It all starts with mercy. Mercy. Because it triumphs over judgment. And so as we talk about mercy this Christmas season, there's one question I want you to ask all these weeks leading up to Christmas. How can I show mer mercy this Christmas season? And specifically, who do I need to show mercy to? I guarantee you there's somebody in your life you need to show mercy to. Show them mercy. They're gonna get to see Jesus. Maybe you need to start with yourself. Maybe you need to start with some mercy for yourself. 
and receive the mercy that God has for you. If that's where you're at, take that mercy this morning. You are, you are, you are always going to live in judgment if you don't receive God's mercy. You are always gonna think less of yourself than what God thinks of you if you don't receive his mercy. And then give that to others. Give that to others. If somebody were to ask me, Paul, what's the most important thing for the church to do in America today? You know what I'd say? I'd say it's to show people mercy. Because nobody else is showing them mercy right now. I promise you that. But as Christians, we can. And we have the calling to do that. So we pray with me this morning. Let's pray. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy upon me. Because, Lord, we come before you as sinners. And while we are saved by grace through faith, every day we need your mercy. And so we hear from your word that your mercy is made new every morning. So thank you, Lord, that you pour out your mercy into our lives. Help us to show mercy to others. Teach us what mercy means. Give us your thoughts and your ways, God, so that we might extend this mercy to everyone around us. Jesus, prepare our hearts and our minds this Advent season for the coming of your Son at Christmas and for your coming, the coming of your Son again into our world. Until he comes again, God, teach us to be merciful. Thank you, Lord, for gathering us together today. Thank you for bringing us together as a family. Thank you for showing mercy upon Meredith Ficken this morning. Thank you for bringing her into your family. Thank you for showing each of us mercy. And so, Lord, because your son is the mercy giver, we come to you and we pray that prayer that he taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.
out of mercy for us. We love you, and we pray that you help us show mercy to others this week as we go and connect faith in life. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Have a great week, and we'll see you next time.